you guys for all being here. My name is Nicole Mendoza and I am the Regional Development Officer for the West. I've been with the organization a full week, so I've got lots of knowledge. Honestly, you guys are all my encyclopedias right now. I'm learning, it's crash course, so I'd love to hear stories introduce myself to you guys personally if you have a moment please say hi I'd love to meet as many of you as I can um, so right now you are in room 707 just want to make sure everyone's in the right spot pre-symptomatic um, I wish I knew what I know now everyone's in the right spot it was early symptomatic. we can go with early as well we'll cover both bases why not um, so thank you guys again for joining us hi welcome welcome there may be a couple people kind of floating in just I mean we all know the elevator situation if you're staying in the hotels moving a little slow so thank you all for being here um, right now we have two really wonderful speakers with us we have Dr. Stuart Factor, who is a professor and director of movement Disorder disorders at Emory University School of Medicine, um, and his memberships include the Huntington Study Group since 1996, and research areas of interest include Parkinson's disease biomarkers, freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease, clinical trials in Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, genetics in Parkinson's disease, and is it tardive symptoms? I just pronounced that correctly? Tardive symptoms. So thank you, Dr. Stewart, uh, Factor, for being here. And then we also have another wonderful speaker here. If you've been walking around, she's probably said hi to you, let's be honest, or you've seen her chatting up a storm. Uh, but we have Karen Millick here. Um, she um, had a mother who was sick with HD, and she decided to get tested in 1994 and tested positive. So um, she got involved with HDSA, HDSA in Rochester, New York, and we're really thankful to have her here with us today. Um, if you do have questions, you can do them on the app. We will take a few in person too, so we'll just repeat the question back um, for the streaming folks at home to hear it but um, thank you guys for being here and without further ado pass it on to you so Karen you were a pioneer because yes. you were tested you were one of the first people tested back in 94 when the test came out yep. I won't sing hi Ivan so I, I think we should uh, talk about your experience with that. But, um, but I'm gonna just start since this is, um, I thought it was early symptoms, <laughs> but um, I thought we could just give you from a physician standpoint some of the early aspects of Huntington's. I'll be quick about it because you all pretty much know about this, but um, um, there are a few aspects that um, we face in our uh, clinic and I thought that uh, maybe we could talk a little about it. So uh, one of the uh, questions we get sometimes from uh, people who are prodromal or at risk is when does Huntington's disease actually start? And uh, so we all kind of know when symptoms start uh, because we get the symptoms, but are there, are there findings before symptoms actually start? And uh, there's a very nice study that was done it was published, uh, I think, 15 years ago or so. It was called the Pharos trial. Uh, it was one of the trials I was involved with. It was uh, for people who were at risk for getting Huntington's but did not want to be tested and didn't want to know what their um, gene status was. And um, uh, these people were enrolled in the study and just followed uh, doing a series, a battery of tests once a year um, kind of like enroll, many of you are probably enroll. It's very similar to that. And uh, they were just followed out uh, 10 years and the data that was published was about six years of data. And um, it was very interesting, about a thousand people enrolled. Everybody was tested, but nobody was told. So we, the investigators, weren't told what the status was. Uh, patients weren't told what the status was. And then they were followed for a long time to actually see when the, di when the disease starts. And what they did find uh, at baseline when people enrolled, so this was probably for many people more than 10 years before they ever got symptoms. Um, there were actually some changes found in the cognitive scales that we did, in the motor scales that were very subtle, not picked up clinically, not something you would see in, in the clinic when you examine patients. And then over time, as patients were followed for that six years, 
um, there was a change in that status, a very gradual, very subtle uh, worsening, mostly of cognitive and motor findings on the exam. For those of you who've been in trials or in enroll, you know what we do, the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale. And so we were able to pick up uh, some changes in that. So Huntington's really starts um, probably a decade, maybe longer, before you ever get symptoms of Huntington's disease. I'm gonna tell you that's not unique. We see that in Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's lose their sense of smell probably 10 years before they get symptoms. They have sleep changes, they have other changes. So, so this is um, um, a, a common thing that we see in um, chronic neurological diseases. So then when symptoms occur, what are they? What are the early symptoms? What should we be thinking about or looking for? And um, there, we always think of Huntington's in three different uh, uh, areas of symptoms, motor, cognitive, and behavioral type symptoms. And so uh, motor symptoms very commonly are just a fidgetiness. It's probably the very beginning of Korea, but people are uh, fidgeting their feet. I actually have to say I do a lot of that myself. <laughs> so, um, and they find that their fine motor tasks start to become impaired slightly. Typing becomes a little impaired. Maybe handwriting changes. Doing fine motor uh, things are, are common early. With uh, uh, cognitive, um, the types of things people start to notice is that uh, I would say probably the most common thing I've heard is they can't multitask like they used to. Uh, taking on multiple different tasks to do becomes a little harder to organize. That may relate to work. Some people have uh, complicated work uh, activities and they find that um, they're not able to keep up as well. For some people, they end up working longer hours just to get done what they used to get done uh, earlier. <clears throat> it's not an uncommon thing as we get older, too. I think uh, some of us could uh, um, uh, agree with that. Uh, and then behavioral changes, um, in looking at the literature, uh, probably the most prominent behavioral changes early relate to depression. And um, uh, so depression is an early feature, it's unrecognized often in patients. Um, part, of, part of being depressed can be irritability, and irritability is something that uh, can become common too. And it just in general, a personality change may be noticed in someone. Now, I have to say, these are not necessarily, not always disease-related, right? Because some people are at risk and they, they don't know their gene status. But uh, they can develop these symptoms because they're nervous about the future and what's happening. Um, there's also apathy, uh, loss of drive that some people begin to notice with that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, though, is that, you know, if you're at risk for Huntington's and you start getting symptoms, one of the big questions is, are these symptoms Huntington's disease? And we do get people who have symptoms that they think is the beginning of Huntington's and it's not, it's other things. Walking problems due to orthopedic issues. Um, other types of behavioral problems. Uh, not long ago we had a, a, you know, a, a young uh, woman who had symptoms of um, autism. Uh, and autism is not a feature of Huntington's disease typically, and um, there were no other features to suggest that it was actually Huntington's related. And as I mentioned, some of the uh, behavioral issues, depression may not be related to developing Huntington's disease. It could be related to family issues and other, uh, other things. So probably very important in relation to that, go see a doctor. Go see a neurologist who's, uh, who knows about Huntington's disease, who can tell you if these symptoms are Huntington's or not, and um, who can help to separate and tease out some of these things. And if, you're not, if you haven't been tested, we'll tell you whether you need to be tested or not uh, as part of the evaluation. Uh, you don't always need to be tested. A uh, few other things just to mention. I spoke to our social workers and our uh, genetics counselor. Um, and um, so people who are in families with Huntington's may need therapists, whether they're gene positive or not. So getting a therapist can be extremely helpful uh, to address many of the 
issues going on in the family and personally, and if a person is beginning to get the symptoms of Huntington's disease, a, ther a good therapist who understands Huntington's will help with acceptance of the diagnosis, um, communicating with family, that's really an important thing, family, friends, coworkers, um, figuring out how to prioritize your life. I'll bet you Karen will tell us more about that. Um, and then, um, you know, addressing issues like testing in families, like in children and in, uh, or young adult uh, children. Uh, they also can address the issue of work, whether you should continue working or not. That's really an important issue in early disease. Many people with Huntington's can continue to work for a long time, but um, being aware of what your needs are at work and, and how you can manage those. Uh, driving is another issue that uh, uh, will need to be addressed. So getting a good, good counselor can really be helpful in answering a lot of these questions. And for families of Huntington's patients, uh, my social worker said, uh, Patience is the most important thing. Patience with a C, not with a T. <laughs> and um, just knowing that changes that occur in Huntington's are part of the disease and not personal and uh, that we need to figure out ways to help people down the road. Uh, so I think I'll stop there. I'll let you, Karen, say a few words. And Hi. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, yeah. I have a lot of answers for all those things that he was talking about. I thought so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about when I went and got tested first. Uh, my mom was sick, and uh, I I was worked in a hospital, so I was okay with you know with the labs and all that. To me, I'm not afraid of blood and all that, but most people are. So. Uh, Pretty at last. I want to hear your mother. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm we want to hear you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I've been. I'm. I've got vaccinated. I am. I'm. Don't. I'm not rabid. Um. <laughs> but uh, uh. So uh. I. I wanted to get tested, and I knew I could handle that because you know I like. I want to be a lab rat. If if I if I have Huntington's, I wanted to get involved and join a study, a drug study. To me, I thought. Uh, that is me um, helping me feel better, um, getting, you know, I tested positive so that I'm, I've said, hey, doctor, I want to sign up for a drug study. And I was so lucky that he said, we have one starting next month. And I signed up for, it was called Care HD. It was for CoQ10. I was a two and a half year study way back then. And uh, I felt better on that CoQ10. And uh, I uh, was taking it, so I still take it now. And I, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not a doctor and all that, but this CoQ10 is really helping me be better. Uh, and the study ended up being not. It didn't show enough of a result for it to say it was good. But they have done the CoQ10 study again with like double the amount, and that one they stopped too. But. I remember phone numbers better back when we had the roll of dolls phones. I'm like, okay, I'm on this drug I know because I had my memory was better. So I felt it. I, I don't care what the results showed on that paper. So I'm still taking 1,200 milligrams a day. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and my sister. At least we know it's safe. Ha yes, we, we know, know it's safe. safe. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, that's true. Yeah. And, uh, and my sisters, they, uh, they don't like hospitals. They don't want to be involved in the studies because they were afraid, you know, they don't want to get a, a, a spinal tap or they're really nervous about going, even being in the hospital. So I figured I might as well do it for them. And then another thing that really helped me back then is I found HDSA. I found that they had, um, they were already a, a something going happening already and they have these conventions every year. So I was like, holy cow, I'm gonna sign up and go. And I, my sister, my older sister, who's um, in a nursing home now, in her last days, but uh, she's like, I'll go with you. So that was uh, nice of her. So we went and that is where it helped me the most, signing up to be here at these. 
in learning all this stuff. And the books, I took those books to the doctors and I helped them treat my mom by what I was, what was in those books. Because the doctors don't know. That's it, sorry. You, you know, but, but the, the regular doctors don't I know. I admit it. Yeah, I mean, they put her on held on. She never spoke again, so yeah. So I, had, I sat there, I was telling them, no, no, do this, do that, do that. And it was, it, I learned a lot from that, but um, um, uh, I lost my thought. But yeah, so uh, the, the, come to the HDSA conventions, get those booklets, you can, they, you can take them home and read all of them. I've, I have them and I read them. I continue to read them again and again. Bec and now they've got them updated. They are great. All right, so then. So can I, I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. So when you were tested in 94, were any of your siblings tested? Oh, no, no. You were the only one. I was the only one, yeah. They both, both my sisters didn't think they had it. And even when uh, they got tested, they thought they were going to be negative and invited me to their negative party. And I said, uh, no, that's not going to happen. You have it, but. Yeah, oh yeah, so. So, uh, so way back then, yeah. in the early 90s, when they found the gene in the 80s, the gene tests came available in 93, there were a bunch of studies that said that 75 to 80 percent of people in families with Huntington's would get tested. Do you guys know how many, what percent of people actually get tested pre-symptomatic? Ten. F five. Five. It's low. It's very low. I anticipate that'll change soon as new treatments come out, but... Um, yeah, but it's just true. interesting that you were one of the first to, well, to go out and do that. I like Batman, so I like to be a superhero. <laughs> so for me, I figured I, uh, this is what I'm going to do and help people. And it, I'm helping people, and I love it, and it's, it comes natural. I don't, it's not like I have to work to have the smile on my face and, um, and help everybody. And, yeah, I'm glad I was part of that. But, yeah, a 5%. Wow. Uh, so, okay, so let's talk about driving. I worked at FedEx. I was a driver. And my sister was a driver, too. And uh, it's kind of scary because, you know, we all don't want to stop driving and have crashes, and you know, because and, uh, driving, we feel independent, and, you know, we don't want anybody to take that away from us, uh, you know. And uh, so I decided to get off the road before my driving got bad, and I took a job in the office at FedEx. And I, it was, you know, it was hard to give that up, but I, it felt much better for me to make the decision I, than for me to have an accident and hurt somebody, and um, then, or get fired for, you know, something for driving my bad accident. So I went in the office. And uh, like, and then though I did stay, in, I stayed an hour extra after my job to finish up my little projects because everything was all over the place, half finished things. But uh, how long did you work when you started getting symptoms? Uh, after. Yeah, I, I've been having symptoms for like twenty-five years. Yeah. And how long were you working for? All of, I just, I've been out of work a year. Oh. I, I worked at FedEx 35 years. And, <laughs> and another thing that helps too, thank you everybody, is I told them I had Huntington's. Okay, and uh, I told them I was going to the PREDICT HD studies in Iowa to get time off, you know, and I had to go and do that. But that helps that they know, and, and, I, and you know, instead of hiding it and, and then not being able to do those things. But uh, I wanted them to be aware of what I had. But that doesn't mean they do know because no one shows up at my walks or anything or they still don't understand about Huntington's at all. But I still told them. Okay, now. Well, Hunt Huntington's is a rare disease. Yes. So a lot of people don't know what Huntington's disease is unless it affects them personally. Right. So. 
But they love me. Yeah. There's no reason not to. (laughs) But they didn't give me money or come to the walks. But I still love them. I'm sorry. I hope you're not on the video. Yeah, they don't want Uh, Okay, so yeah, so I've been in a bunch of the research studies. I so did. why don't you talk about your experience in the, in the trials? Ah. What it was like to be in a okay. double-blind trial, possibly yeah. getting placebo. That's really an important thing. People always ask us those things. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because uh, people say, oh, I don't want you to go get in that study because I love you enough that I want you to be in a drug. I don't want to see you get more symptomatic because you're on a placebo. And I said to them, well, someone needs to do this. I will sign up because I am not afraid to be here, and I will do it. I will risk being on the placebo to help everybody. Um, And and, uh, I I did it, and I don't mind. So just to say, um, the comment you made, a lot of people make that comment. I don't want to be on placebo. I want to be on the drug. The expectation is the drug works, but... We're actually doing the study because we don't know if the drug works. And um, so, um, it, first of all, we need to know if it's better than nothing, which is what placebo is. And, um, and the FDA needs to know that in order to approve a drug. So placebo-controlled trials are standard. If it's unethical to be on a placebo, then we don't do it. And there are trials where two different drugs are tested instead of having a placebo. Oh. But... Um, uh, but placebo, the reason for doing that is we really don't know if these drugs work, and we have to find out if they work or not. Yeah, and, and the FDA, they do a really good job of uh, making sure everything um, is up to standards before they get it approved. And, right, and the key thing is safety of the people who participate, yeah. making sure you're safe. Yeah. And, um, and if you are in a study, and if you do have anything that happened, you got to tell them. You know, and don't don't be embarrassed. You know, I had diarrhea on that medicine. You know, and I was in a study, and I I did drop out of that one because I had diarrhea. I was like, I can't be on this anymore. I I want to live. Uh, so you're you're allowed to drop out. Yeah, and anytime. I dropped out, uh, but I I started. I tried. Uh, you know, so try, and and if you you know, you're gonna feel better just for even trying. And I'll I'll give you a big hug. And we can't develop new things unless yeah. you participate in the trial. That is true, very true. Now also, I also did get long-term health care. I bought it early and uh, um, I've got a will and my, all my stuff in order and I told my family who was in charge of me and they aren't. I have a, f- a friend because <laughs> family members do fight or don't agree on, like I, I, I fell off a horse, I had a brain injury. And my sisters wanted to sell my house and, and be, I was gone. I wasn't gonna be alive another day they thought. But, but I had to fight with them and I told them who was in charge of everything. You gotta have those hard conversations with your family. Tell them what you want. Don't, don't let them tell you what, you, you know, what they want. You know, uh, how, you know, do you want a feeding tube? And we have to have these conversations now while you're not sick and while you're totally there before you even have any symptoms even is the best time because then we know it's really your brain telling you what you want and not something else and uh um like the feeding tube and put it in writing yeah uh, yeah put it in writing and give it to everybody yeah beforehand yeah i yeah and also like uh i sometimes you have to not talk to your family members because we have family members there don't want to talk about huntington so Find somebody that, that you can talk to that's your person. I, I have a, a video, I guess I'm in now, I've, uh, my trainer shared it. I have a trainer that's helping me with my balance. And he actually holds my hands and have me, I stand up like I'm on an elephant little stand and then I get off and, and he holds me and, and helps me. And he talks to me and he asks me questions. If I'm eating right, you know, if I'm doing my stuff for my Huntington's, he cares more than some of my family members in that sense. You know, he, he, and he understands what my disease is and he's trying to help me. And you, so, and that helps. Or, and you also, social workers too. Uh, you know, uh, I never saw a uh, clinical uh, 
a counselor ever. But uh, many social workers are counselors yeah. too. Okay, yeah, but social the, the social workers are amazing. Okay, and when I called uh, HCSA, uh, Alicia Bartlett, and talked to her, she gave me, and I thought I knew everything since I come here all the time, but I learned that I needed to go on short-term disability with FedEx and get paid while I apply for Social Security, for disability Social Security. And that way, I was not working anymore and not causing any problems, and I then was get, still getting paid. And I got approved, so then I went out on, on disabilities. So that worked good. But uh, the social workers really help. And also my social worker told me, another social worker said, you're gonna do less better. And I still to this day keep that in my head now. Karen, you gotta do less because I have Huntington's and I can't multitask like I used to. Well, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> uh, but um, I want to do a little better and be here and do everything. It sucks sometimes, so sorry. Is that a bad word? So, so what's your secret? You have symptoms for 25 years and you look amazing. So yeah, what's your secret? I, I run and I ran indoor, outdoor and cross country in high school and that and I still run now. I just I did the New York Marathon a couple of years. I'm doing the New York Marathon this year again. Um, I run and um, bike, and uh, I will swim too. I've got a pool, so I can swim in my pool. All oh, right, I do the triathlon in um, Miami, and that's really cool too down there. She says, "Hey, Karen, do you mind if you have a special s swim cap on?" So you have, you, I have my own person watching me while I'm swimming in the water. I was like, that's so cool, thank you. But I have to accept the fact that I'm not normal. I have a problem and I need to take the help because I don't like to take help. I like to be very independent and stubborn and on my own. Up, oh, I hear a yes right there. <laughs> so exercise. Real, exercise really is important. so good. Really important for all neurological diseases. Yeah, they showed that mice on that thing. I've got that. I've, I've got the flyer on my um, wall at home. Mice in, on a marathon. They show them on that treadmill. There's Dr. Jane Paulson raising your hand. But uh, it really helps. And I, it, I am here. I mean, my other sister passed away at 50, and my other sister is only a year older than me, and she's going to be gone. And I, I think I look pretty good. Oh, she's clapping back there. Yeah, I do. So thank you. Look you. Great. And yeah. So should we take some questions? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> All right, don't have anything in here. Does anyone in the room have any questions? Yeah. So as a doctor, how have you found or has there been uh, done any research? Yeah, I'm going to just repeat it for the stream. So the question was, has there been any research on how drinking affects Huntington's disease, correct? Yes. Great. You're talking about drinking alcohol. Yes. Yeah. Water. <laughs> water. We need water. Um, actually, I don't know of any studies that have looked at alcohol, uh, but, you know, just as a clinician, um, because balance issues and cognitive issues or problems with Huntington's, alcohol can certainly make those worse. Maybe, uh, maybe Jane in the back can comment about that. Alcohol and... Uh, yeah, and most of those studies are, do you remember what you used to drink? And uh, we need to do more prospective uh, studies on that. But. But I can say that, um, in general, we don't recommend that our patients drink alcohol. Yeah, and just to, Coffee, uh, on the other hand, coffee is good for you, yeah. so. Yeah. And just to clarify that answer, it was higher intake of alcohol can have an earlier onset of symptoms, in correct? That in that one self-reporting study. So yes, so more to be researched there. Well, I, I would say we certainly have used um, virtual visits 
uh, regularly since COVID came, and I still do virtual visits with my Huntington's patients. So I think for general, um, you know, care, follow-up care over time, I think it can be very helpful, and uh, we certainly utilize that. I do think personally that uh, to make a diagnosis of someone who has early symptoms, it's best to see people face-to-face, -face, do a full exam, uh, get a good sense of it, and, um, and I, I just feel personally that I'd rather have you in front of me when I'm telling you if you have a diagnosis like that or other neurologic disease instead of on a computer screen. So I think for follow-up care, it, it's fine. You probably should be seen face-to-face -face maybe once a year, and, but in between visits can be done virtually. And that's what we do in our practice. Well, walking's aerobic. By the way, that guy. It's good too. This, Just good. This, this guy, he's another amazing guy who's done yeah. incredibly well for, for a while. But I, I would say walking is probably as good as running. You know what I do now? I am out of shape, so I'm starting again for this, this year for the marathon. But uh, my uh, at the gym at the she's like, just put the um, treadmill up two little steps and keep walk and just make sure your feet stay ahead of you and i also plug in so i don't fall off you know how every, no one else is plugged in you know to the in case you fall but i plug in but you can walk on the treadmill and that way you don't fall outside because uh, i fall a lot so uh the treadmill is safe, and I do walk now too, so that, yeah, that helps just as much. And treadmill's better for your yeah. joints. Yep. Yeah. Because it's softer and. I got. I know. forgot one more thing <clears throat> I want to say is I have to uh, make sure to take your medicines. You know, we all are. I mean, all of us kind of blow off our medicines on a day-to-day -day basis. We sometimes say, eh, I'm not gonna take it, or they taste gross." But make sure you continue to take all your meds. Um, and that, that is a big thing to help you stay uh, healthier longer, too. Great. David? <laughs> Someone else had a question over there. Yeah. yeah, it's not a question. I'm just back to kind of the alcohol. Um, I, have, I was diagnosed in 2017, and I have a cousin who's three months younger than I am. And um, he's had a lifestyle that's totally different than mine, drugs, alcohol streets and you name it and his symptoms are in the later stage mm -hmm. whereas i have yet to show any signs so um not from what um so yeah so even though it's not a study that to me is enough that diet and exercise and lifestyle mm -hmm. plays a huge part in yep the whole progression of, of hd yeah, just, just to revisit the alcohol thing. Alcohol is a toxin. It destroys brain cells. I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not a, um, you know, a, 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 and so you have a disease where you're losing brain cells, and then you're taking a toxin that's accelerating that. So certainly makes sense that that is what you would see. Yeah, and just to um, clarify for those at home, it was basically an experiential confirmation that someone who also is positive has a very different lifestyle with drugs, alcohol, just lifestyle makes such an impact. And so she has seen a family member whose disease has progressed much more than her own because of that difference in lifestyle. Um, uh, I'm just going to cut you really quick, Quirin. So the question was, were there any medications um, in Karen's experience with dealing with clinical trials that have helped her in her journey? The yeah, the no, the one, the two I was in, I dropped out of the one, and the other one they said it wasn't. The others I've been in was the uh, Predict and the Enroll, and those there's no medicines. But the, those are the ones. If you're in those, when they have the drugs. The first drug that they get the, the uh, go for us to take it, they're going to go to those records and find the people on those lists because they can see exactly how you are uh, from those taking those tests. I mean, I, I'm a pro at taking those tests. <laughs> red, 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 green, 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 blue, blue, blue. Right? I mean, oh my, uh, and you feel, every time I take that test, all those tests, I feel like a real silly, stupid person. 
I'm like, oh, I can't remember any letters, and I don't know any of this stuff. But you can't let it get to you. You can't. You just. I just go. Okay, you took it. <sighs> You'll be okay. Ah, you know. And it, but they're hard. They, and they make you feel weird and awful for a while. And the spinal taps. I've done a few, and um, they're pretty good. I got. I did have a headache, but uh, uh, I don't mind taking it. They're pretty easy on you know the people. In the, you know they're a little harder if you're. Uh, on the heavy set person, but anybody else, they practice so much, they're good at those. And spinal taps are routine tests that we do in the hospitals all the time. When we're in training as residents, we, we do a zillion of them. And it's becoming a very important uh, test for other neurological disease too. We do them in Parkinson's disease all the time, and we do them in Huntington's disease, and it's you know, it, it, people shouldn't be afraid of it. It's it's a pretty standard bedside test that we do. Just a reminder for those at home, if you want to submit a question, you can do it. So on your page, it should be on your right hand side of your screen. So we're still taking questions. Um, yes, please. Yeah. So the question was, can we utilize mechanisms like the MRI to kind of scan and check on Huntington's diagnoses? Is there an option that maybe it's a year, an annual scan that's taken to compare year over year to help with diagnoses and progression? So, so it's kind of funny. And again, Jane is an expert yeah. on this because she did Jane, the pre wave, predict wave. study. But as a practitioner, um, when the genetic test came out, we actually started doing fewer MRIs because the genetic test was um, was more specific in making the diagnosis than an MRI, which just really showed atrophy of certain parts of the brain. Uh, before the the um, you know the uh, uh, genetic test was out, they were doing all kinds of little measures to see how big your caudate nucleus was, and and they, they were not really very specific. So we've kind of moved away from that, but the technology of MRI is changing a lot. There's a lot of MRI research going on new types of uh, MRIs are being done, metabolic MRIs to look at metabolism in the brain, things like that. So I, I think we, we may see some of those as, as tools for measuring progression of disease. Jane, did you wanna comment about that or? Yep. That, yep. th this we is your you. thing. Here, I'll give you. Uh, so Jane, say, Jane, if you would like to speak on the mic, I don't wanna, I don't wanna mess up your beautiful answer that you're gonna give right now. <laughs> I'm not an expert on it, but I do feel strongly about collecting the data because these treatments are not only increasing in frequency, but in the numbers of ho and the hopefulness of them and the, uh, the design mechanisms are so much better than they used to be that we are going to find treatments that are going to either slow or protect those neurons or slow the onset. And I feel strongly that if you are at risk and willing to participate in research, if you can be like Karen and, you know, come forth. We have a study. We do do, the only reason we keep doing the brain scans isn't to help with the diagnosis. It is to say to the drug companies, we are envisioning a future where you will have choices of treatments. And when you're 18, you probably don't want to have brain surgery. But maybe if you're 40 and, and you're like 45 is the age of onset, maybe then you want to go to a urinary cure surgery. But same with ASOs. You don't want to have injections for too many years, but maybe 10 years before, people would like to go with ASOs. And Dr. Factor is helping us out with this. The clinicians are working. But early on, the neural protective factors you might want when you're 18 or 20, right? Because it's just a pill and the side effects we're figuring out. But thank goodness for like the two people running this seminar, we are gonna know this. And so I just give a pitch to please be in the prevent HD study because without it, we can't figure out how to measure what the treatment is doing. So we put you in a clinical trial now when they come back to us and say, oh, wow, we found a treatment that slows this disease, then they're going to say, well, who can take it? And if they give it to you and, and you don't know because you have no symptoms, how do we know if it's working and what if it's having a side effect, right? So we need the scans right now to say when this amount of your caudate is gone, this percentage, you definitely should go to the infusions. 
when this amount is gone, you should just stick with the pill. Maybe uh, Perlinia's pill is going to work for that. So we are going to help you as a healthcare community say, this is when you stick to the pill, this is when you start an injection, this is when you start a brain surgery, and this is, you always need the love and support of one another. And the exercise and nutrition, key throughout. Yep. Key throughout, and that's why you're here. But if you can help us design new measures, my study is really about building new measures so that doctors like Dr. Factor will say, we don't need an MRI to tell you that you are at risk for Huntington's disease. We don't need an MRI to tell you when you have the disease. We might need an MRI or a PET scan or a measure of neurofilament light chain from your blood or from your CSF to tell you it's definitely time for you to start treatment even if there's side effects. Because like Karen, there might be a day when you say, Okay, I can take some diarrhea today if it's going to slow my <laughs> yeah, HD, right? right? Yeah. And then there's going to be the day when you say, yeah. there is no way I'm going to take that med that gives me chronic diarrhea. I'm not going to be the cool adolescent at age 18 going no. to college with my diaper on. Yeah. No, no thank you. Right. So that's why I think we really need your partnership. And so volunteer for everything that Dr. Factor and Karen and all of us are trying to encourage you to do and we'll try to make it painless. But that's why I'm still doing scans. I'm trying to get a better and better, stronger magnet, better measures so we can go in earlier. Because the, the MRIs showed changes 12 years before the motor manifestation wow. occurred yeah. on average. 12 years before. And we were seeing motor manifestations 10 years before you exactly. had a clinical diagnosis. Exactly. Yeah. And the cognitive was even earlier. We took all the people out of that study that had absolutely no motor. They had zero motor, and they still had cognitive changes. So wow. we're trying to push it back. So when they say, yippee, we're, we're going to be at this convention soon, and they're going to say, we have something that's slowing it, and I want us to be able to say, we can get offer it to everybody and slow it wherever you're at. So help us out. Be a Thank partner. You, Thank you, Thank you. Karen. You did not. Thank you. Just well, one, one other point about this. This is something we face with Parkinson's all the time. Is we're getting better and better symptomatic drugs, and so if you're on, you know, Ostido or one of the other drugs, and it's controlling your movements. We can't tell how you're progressing. It, the, the medication sort of masks that. So doing all these tests may actually give us a way to measure progression of disease. The gene test doesn't tell you how you progress either. So we don't really know how to measure progression of disease. And, um, you know, so we need to find something that will allow us to do that. So MRI could be one. Spinal fluid could be another. Blood test could be another. Yeah, so the comment was um, in possibly doing scans and getting more information in something that could be more digestible or more visual of just changes within your brain, for example, with an MRI, could that assist patients in working through towards acceptance that this is a reality for them or could be in the future? I think that's really a great point. And, and actually, we use clinical assessments to do, the, to do that as well. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to ask yeah. Dr. Factor. Are the motor measures only measure them at a level you can't tell? Like if you press your hands together, how much force can you give? And how consistent is your force? Look at I'm shaking because I'm a little nervous, right? Because I'm standing here now. <laughs> so but but that's what we measure with these quantitative motor exams, and they're basically taking what Dr. Factor does in the office and then moving them to a little thing like a cell phone or an iPad. And that's what we're trying to do in the study. Right now we're using iPads and we want to move to cell phones. So we really yeah. need your help and get these measures so you can wake up in the morning and your phone is say, enter your force pressure. Okay. Good thing. Go on with your day. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So so um, basically, in these motor testings, that's kind of where we're getting to what you were speaking about, of having these visuals. It's really more in like the tactile and the physical representation. So maybe we can get to a point with technology where you wake up in the morning, the example just given was you are able to do a pressure test on your cell phone so that we can manage that data and kind of watch the progression of those sort of changes. So thank you, that's super interesting. Speaking of pressure test, I think your handwriting also is affected by 
And atrophy is a normal thing that happens to us as we get older. And I agree with you. We see people in the clinic who have very atrophied brains that are still functioning quite well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually. Brain is very plastic. Yeah. So we are only using, what, 20% uh, of the brain cell. So there's a lot of spare capacity being used, and, and the brain adjusts that. Yeah. yeah. The note I, was um, that um, there, there's a lot more of our brain to be used. We're not using it in that true. capacity, which is a great point. We actually have a question um, through the chat. So it says, are there any supplements that have shown to, been shown to help with symptoms? COQ10 was mentioned. And are there any others that can be recommended? Well, I take fish oil, CoQ10, blueberry pill, a multivitamin, and... Um, Um, oh, I also, well, then it's this um, protein drink that has uh, all these other supplements. But, uh, um, gosh, what is the name of that? It's like Kineco or something. I just started taking it because I have like nine pills and I can't swallow them. They're awful. So I decided to buy this protein stuff that has all these supplements in it and drink that with my vitamins. So I'm helping myself. Yeah. Uh, I did once a while, a long time ago, some of us tried creatine and they started a study and, but then they had said that, you know, that you need to see the doctors because you can have issues with your body with that. So I stopped taking the creatine. So if memory serves, clinical trials, CoQ10, creatine, fish oil, a form of fish oil. Um, I can't remember others, but uh, unfortunately all those trials were negative. Yeah. But I think that brings us back to the, what was brought up over here, a good diet, you know, good exercise. Not too much it, alcohol. Not too much alcohol. <laughs> now, another thing, I, uh, I, I had no idea I had any symptoms. Okay, well, first of all, my uh, girlfriend said, if you don't get on some medicine, I'm leaving you. Because I was, that's how cranky I was at home, and I didn't even notice it. I mean, we don't notice how we act unless people tell us a lot of times. And, um, th oh, yeah, another thing to that, too, that now I've asked, I tell all my friends and people, tell me if, if I'm cranky or if you see something I'm doing that's not right, because I don't think my brain is going to tell me I know. So I want them to tell me. And they all know. I said my driving, my irritability. You know, I, my sisters were very, very irritable, and suicidal. You know, both were in Baker acted, and um, but I, I want everybody to tell me driving, crankiness, whatever, and they tell me. And, and actually, that's one reason I stopped working. A friend said, "You you need to stop working," and I. Did. But and also so so but then I watched myself in my a video of one of these shows I did and I called my niece and I said oh my gosh I think I need to stop working look at me how am I moving around so much and uh, c because my eyes are the same eyes I've had since I was born I see out I don't see in I can't see how I'm acting how I'm moving how, how I'm reacting. But um, when I watched that video, I, you see a lot more. In fact, I had told my doctor, 
I said, I think you need to do a video of people and show it to them when they come every year for their visit because then I think they might understand how they are progressing more than just what you tell them by those tests. Yeah. So it's all part of the acceptance yeah. of the diagnosis and the symptoms, yeah. which is really key. Going back to the supplements and vitamins, the big question is CBD and the, the question was, um, basically, can we more, know more about CBD and THC concerning HD? Does the CBD1 receptor in your brain and the CB2 receptor in your brain? So there have been a few small studies, you know, small numbers of patients, 10, 20 patients with uh, CBD, and they haven't really shown anything. Um, I don't recommend CBD to any of my patients. Uh, in Parkinson's disease, there have been some reports out of Canada of um, uh, hallucinations and psychotic symptoms, even from just CBD, not even THC. Uh, so we try to uh, avoid those if we, if we can. I also have very, a, very I have a one, marijuana one, card. Yeah, one other thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> one other. Thing. I would just. In, in Colorado, there was a study in Parkinson's disease, CBD, and 40% of people had abnormal liver tests. Oh, yeah. So you have to watch out for that, too. I am totally against drugs. When my niece told me she was smoking, I was freaking crazy. And then, uh, and then I was like, you know, because it's a drug and we shouldn't take it. But I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I mean, I stay up all night. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, I tell myself, you are grounded, you can't take a nap during the day because you're not sleeping at nighttime, so you need to do whatever you can to make you sleep. But it's not happening. Every hour I'm up, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up. Yeah. And, and I tried the medicine and the drug medicine, you know, from my doctor, they prescribed some pills, they didn't work. But I, t I take a couple gummies, but uh, I am now gonna try, I just saw something else, some other um, oil. Um, I can't remember the name. My brother sent me a link. I'm going to try that because I'm not for taking drugs because they do kill your brain cells. But I have to sleep do, right now. Do the gummies help you sleep? Uh, yes, some, but not enough. Um, I actually have a question for you, Karen. So since you've been on this journey from kind of watching your mother go through HD and then your own diagnoses to where you are now about 25 years after initial symptoms, what would be, um, what would have been helpful for you emotionally as you were kind of moving through those stages? Because we've talked a lot about science, we've talked a lot about the physicality, but the emotional toll that that can take on you as a patient and family also and friends and support, like what would have been helpful for you in terms of your, your community around you? Were there questions that would have been helpful for them to ask you? Were there check-ins? Just I'm curious what that looks like for you. I tried to get tested without my family knowing. I, I, I wanted them to not know, but then my best friend told them. But it was probably better that they know, but I wanted to, to go without it, and that way if I was negative, I would just have to tell them a happy you know, thing and not tell them I had symptoms. But uh, yeah, uh, if my sister had been there with me, it would have been a lot better. And then they, I wouldn't have had the denial uh, talking to them that and later on. One of my sisters got an accident, uh, a car accident. She calls me on the phone and she's like, I have, they said I have atrophy on my brain. Do you think I have Huntington's? And I lied to her. I said, no, I don't think you have Huntington's because I wasn't ready to have that conversation with her. But I should have, because I should have, st we should have all started together as a family and we should, you know, everything. That way, th she would have been taken care of sooner, both my sisters, because they both um, handled the whole Huntington's really bad. So I, you know, education, one of the big things is education about the disease. And a lot of people don't want to know about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, having proper education before being tested is really, really important. And sometimes the family members, you know, uh, don't get properly uh, educated about it, the, you know, the spouses and 
maybe the children and others. So I, I think education of the families is really, really important part of this. And But you, you can't force family members to get tested, right? Everybody's no. got to do it on their own terms at their own yeah. time. But uh, being open about it and saying, I'm going to go get tested, but not forcing them to do it is... Yeah, just have be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think you've been a shining example of, if not me, who? Right. And yeah. that takes a lot of strength and courage. And I'm sure even though there was some denial in, in family, like that is all processing and sitting with them. And so I just want to say thank, thank you, you for your courage in that. That's thank amazing. You. I, I personally am hopeful that a lot of this will change mm -hmm. as we get treatments um, that are available. Then people will want to know more, want to be educated more about it, know when it's time for them to get treatments uh, participate in more trials, things like that. I think th that all serves to educate uh, yeah. people more, not only the people who are at risk, but their families and friends. And Well, I, I also have long-term health care because I don't want any of my, my family members having to dress me or um, feed me or vacuum my house. And, you know, uh, so I bought a three-year plan, and that makes me feel better just knowing that that's there if when I need it. And I don't want to be in a nursing home, and everybody knows that. Never, never, never. Um, and no feeding tube. And, but, uh, and now I'm like, well, I don't know if I'm ever going to use that long-term health care because I'm doing so good. <laughs> and I feel like I wasted three-year payment going, should I stop paying on it? You know? But, but I've been paying don't, on it for like 20 years on. now. <laughs> yeah, 20 years I've been paying on it, so it's there. Dang it. Can I sell it to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, since you since you mentioned long term care, I just wanted to double check. But after this session at three thirty, there is a specific session about long term okay, care. Yeah. So just so you guys know, it's going to be it. right across the hall in seven oh one. So if yeah. that's something that's kind of piqued your interest as she's brought it up, that's going to be um, at three thirty. And when you get tested, you you can't um, if you have your name on that, you can't get those things. You can't get insurance, you know, um, and long term health care. Or um, you've got to make sure everything's in order. I mean, I knew I was staying at FedEx, and I, that's why I could tell them, because I wouldn't tell somebody if you weren't going to stay there, because they may use it against you to fire you, you know, later on or whatnot. Or if you're going through a divorce or whatnot, this information could be, you know, harmful. But, but you have to think and, and, and find a job that you know you want to stay at and, and then get this all in order. We had a comment come through um, the Q&A, and it said, my husband has had improvements with the tincture, cat's claw, reducing falling and more alert in the evening, et cetera. So we do have what someone. It? It's called cat's claw, and it's a tincture. Cat's claw. Mm -hmm. So it's just a comment that came through on the Q&A. Great. Are there any other questions here in the room? It's amazing what people can find on the internet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, that, like I said, there's that long-term care one right after here at 3.30. It's 2.30 right now, just to give you an oh, yeah. idea. And, and downstairs, you can donate your blood. Okay, this is the first time they've ever been here donating. You know, you can sign up and be in this. And they also ask these questions, a lot of questions, on um, on um, making sure everybody, where when they go in and go to the doctors, they have it can get it paid for and whatnot. Because there are a lot of us that it's not, you know, we don't have any, enough money to see the doctor. But those qu questions I answered down there, I think that's going to help um, people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple thoughts. As you two were talking, I was jotting down some things that I wanted to reiterate with everyone else. Um, Karen, you made the comment, doctors don't know everything. I'm sorry, Dr. Factor, they don't. And. That's not by I their can own vouch goals, for that. Right? And it's it's a matter of just education. So by you guys being here and kind of taking these thoughts and ideas and different practices to your own doctors, that causes our medical um, and care providers to push themselves further to be more educated. So you guys are in the right spot. I absolutely love that. Um, and when you are looking for information, the website has a ton of materials. There are brochures outside over where all the beautiful t-shirts and jackets and hats are for sale. 
Um, and then also all of the different sessions that are happening over the next couple of days will be online in the next couple of weeks. So while you're here, there's other great discussions happening. So be sure to check our YouTube or you know just go through the conference link and you'll be able to see those recordings. Um, another note was we do have a social worker that's here um, over in the exhibitor area. So if you have questions, like that was such a fascinating story, Karen, and you told me it yesterday about looking at disability while doing social security. And those are things that are, those are systems that are not set up to be easy, unfortunately. So when you have the resources like social workers within the different parts of the country, please utilize those resources. I've been in nonprofit for 10 years, and this is actually the first organization that I know that offers that service yes. um, to help you navigate it. So it is very rare and extremely helpful. So I wanted to remind you guys I'll about just that. say we've been lucky enough to have social workers, but yeah. during times when we didn't, we were able to utilize the services that HDSA yeah. had. Yeah, Yes. absolutely. Wonderful, were there any other questions in the room? I don't know really what a cat <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to first say your story is really inspirational. Thank you. Um, but do you, you have such a positive outlook and you seem to kind of have your ducks in a row. I guess do you have specific tools that have helped you with that? Yeah, the question it's was, just, the question was does Karen have tools to help I her stay positive? I, I don't know. I just have been lucky. The day I got my test results, I didn't cry. I mean, it was weird. I just went and got shopping and just signed up for the drug study. I, I don't know, it just happened. I don't know how, but I am just so grateful. Yeah, I call myself, like my, my, to my niece, I was kidding, I said, I feel like a little mini Gandhi. You know, that, <laughs> that, that I am so good. But, you know, but the, it's also very scary because I know the others, I know the dark side, and I'm afraid one day I'm gonna wake up and be like that. But right now, I am happy. Um, my husband had had kids, he passed away recently, but um, his two of his sisters had it, and they would not speak of it. It was like, it was, it was like, you don't talk about it. And we decided we wanted to have kids, so he was like, okay, let's get tested, and we just want to make sure we didn't pass on the gene, so we did some genetic things so our children aren't at risk. But we talked about it all the time, but up until, like, up until, um, he started having symptoms like we kind of went dark after he found like we did talk about it like we knew he had it we did the right things to have children so they were they're not at risk but then we stopped talking about it and then he started having a neurological and i'm like what's going on here because you know going to the doctor they didn't say oh this could happen you know like i always got that there's no norm to huntington's i'm like okay well this is happening oh yeah that's huntington's i'm like it is, that's how it is. I'm like, okay, is there a list somewhere? Like, there's, all I got was there's no norm. And um, his doctor took him off all of his anxiety medicine. He switched doctors, and his new doctor's like, oh, I, it's such a low dose, because he did tell his doctor he had Huntington. Oh. So he went, it, went, it got really bad, and I, and I would never, we never talked about it. So it got to the point where I was going to, we actually were going to get a divorce because he got violent. I would never, I'm like, that's not ever going to happen in my life, you know, like, and I said, you need to up your meds, because we never talked about it, and he went, what meds? Oh, and I was like, I'm divorcing you right now, like, the next day he got back on medicine, we've never fought again, like, it was, like, huge, I mean, amazing, but, like, the non-talking causes, I think, a lot of the anger, and, like, because there's no communication there. But once we, that was the day, like doors, floodgates open, like there was communication all the time. So his sisters never talked about it. So they refused to get any medicine. They wouldn't even accept they had it. And they had like the one sister had movements. I mean, she's going, I don't think I have Huntington's. I'm like, do you see your arm right now? She's like, what? And she just refused. Like they, she couldn't see it because we didn't talk about it. It was like, I think the talking is, the key to everything. Yeah. 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 100%. Yeah. So, I mean, with that experience, like communication is so key. It's a matter of coming to that acceptance, but like, it's, it's wonderful that you voiced your opinion as a caregiver and a family member and a wife that we need to talk about this. This is the reality of things and pushing it aside is 
not progressing us any further. So I'm very much summarizing her story because it's really, it's really a wonderful yeah. one. Just advocating for yourself as a caregiver actually helps you to advocate for the patients in your life. And we had, care, we had caregivers come in early because I was, I'm a teacher and I was working. He was calling like, where does the pink skirt go? He's doing laundry. I'm like, you can't call me every 15 minutes. Like, and he didn't know. It's just one of those, you know, and um, so I had to have someone come in so I didn't get a hundred phone calls. I'm like, I need to not lose my job, you know. And he was just doing laundry. Like, you know, you would never even, he had no physical symptoms. And um, so we, so he had someone in the house that, so he was, you know, still like aware and conscious, like about his choices, and he um, sideswiped the car. So I said that could have been a kid. Have up no more driving. He was like, okay. And then like we go to switch to his sisters, and they're like, I don't need any medicine. No one's coming in to help me. Like the husband, my brother-in-law, try to hire somebody, and she would lock out the caregiver, wouldn't let them in the house because it was now too. It was now, I, I, I'm like, it's too late now. Like they're yeah. set in their ways. It's kind of. You have to start early. I think that's the key, yeah. starting before everything. Yeah, because starting just, before the symptomatic yeah, behaviors. Yeah, my brother-in-law never had any help. He did it 100% himself because she would not even allow his mother-in-law in the house when it got to that point. It was just, yeah. yeah. So Thank you. Communication, communication is yeah. everything. Thank and you, you so should much. see a real, you should go to an HD doctor. You know, they have centers, I, I, they didn't have a, a doctor back in Florida back then, a center of excellence, so I saw a, neuro, a movement disorder uh, neurologist. But um, you, we have all these centers of excellence. We have to see those doctors because they know us. They know how to, you know, they would have yeah, we, helped better well, yeah, the, for that. Well, yeah, the C started with yeah. symptoms. We, I mean, we went to Pittsburgh, we drove Pittsburgh, and we did the Q10 study, we did the MRI study, okay. we did in Rural HD, we did like everything. He was just open to everything and anything it was amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then a social worker, I mean not a social worker, but you should go to a, a support groups. Yes, support groups. Because they really helped too. Yeah. Um, I did have a comment come through um, from Faith that says she was denied long-term care due to her father's positive test results. They said that if she was negative, they would reconsider it. She did test positive with a 42 CAG, and if she increased her VA disability to 60%, they would cover it. So that was a positive spin on the whole thing for her. So again, using the resources to help you find the ways to navigate all of the systems. Again, we are not built to be experts in these, so we need to lean into those people that are. That, I'm sorry, this is a comment from family. My wife is a veteran service officer for the disabled American veterans. The best advice or an answer for that person is go to a VSO officer, they know the system, they can get appointments, paperwork, care for that, for that, for her, for her VA disability. Our adopted son is at 90%, so one of our big things is he has care. We're, we're good. We're, he has care. Because for me, there's the thing called the law, they can't hold pre-existing conditions against you, and then there's reality. They can hold everything and yes, anything they can. against you in, in, okay. in any form. It doesn't have to be, oh, their work progression has slowed down, they're not fast enough anymore, you don't know, what it's not from Huntington's, but, well, you know, so there's the law of the reality. Yeah. And like I say, that, that person needs to go to a VSO, because they know the system, they know the paperwork and the process, <laughs> importantly is they know to ask the right questions yeah thank you so much for that so the advice for anyone that is a veteran is to go to a VSO because they're gonna be the ones that know how to navigate those systems um, know the correct paperwork terminology coding um, all of the things that would be available to navigate those well, systems on that our son can't get care under Huntington's with the VA he has to get it under Sundering stone, something, I can't, it's a, a different word. It's a neurological movement disorder. They don't have Huntington's yet. They've got this other neurological yeah. condition. Yeah, again, insurance coding can be so interesting and intricate, and sometimes it can be HD, but if it's coded in various capacities, and I'm sure Dr. Factor can probably speak a little bit more into that, but yeah, I have seen that. I've talked to a few patients who've had to navigate it that way as well. Do you have and if add? you're not a veteran, 
social worker is the next step for all that. Wonderful. We have about 15 minutes. Does anyone else have any additional questions for Dr. Factor or Karen? No? Well, wonderful. No, oh, go right ahead. Well, I'll say I got a million. I just can't think of it. Somebody says a, word, a magic word. That pops We're all getting triggered with other yeah. questions by everyone else. Yeah. That's why we have these, right? Because we, we have so many things going on, and it's mm. hard to nail them down sometimes. I got early age testing below 18. Um, when the backstory is adopted son, his mom died at 46, 48. Um, we were on a fishing trip and came home with a whole bunch of newspapers. I saved one newspaper. I also go to the obituary. If I'm not in the obituary, I'm doing good. <laughs> I come to the obituaries and I'm like, oh, mom's in there and my brain immediately goes into overdrive okay I gotta get him tested I gotta get him do this do that do this his doctor his primary pediatrician says slow down take a breath step back do not test him no symptoms he was 12 or something like that years old I think or something no symptoms don't test him. If you tested him, we'll treat him differently if he comes up positive. And I'm glad we took that. Right. We don't, we don't test asymptomatic children. We, you wait till they're 18, and then they can make their own decision about testing if they want to be tested or not. My son, he's a Marine. He likes to chase girls, drink. He drinks excessively sometimes. We try and encourage him not to drink. One or two beers here, son, you're fine. You can, party, you can party eight hours with two beers. You're fine. No, but he's got to go for the 10 to 12 to 15 and then the 10 or 15 shots. But I have to respect him, too, because he goes, hey, I'm going to die, so I might as well have fun along the way. You know, but what do you do? I feel like that's the ever-present parent-child di dynamic, right? <laughs> and we also get we also get obsessed with things, you know. So everybody has, yeah, uh, with yeah. the Huntington, you get obsessed. There's something you just want more than anything else, and it happens, you know. Uh, my mom, it was denture cream. <laughs> she had a purse full of it. But, I mean, I mean, I mean, he, you know, he thinks that beer makes, is what makes him feel better, so. You can, they have medicine that can help him, you know, for the anxiety, too. Well, he's an adrenaline junkie. He's, he's always experienced sports things, you know, backflips on bicycles, and, but that makes him happy, so well, I'm not going to stop him. Yeah. Any additional questions, thoughts, encouragements? Well, you guys have been a great audience. Thank, Thank you. you. This panel has been incredible. Thank you guys so much. But yes, if you guys that are at all at any point have any additional questions about HDSA or just want to say hi or want to meet some community, all of these faces in this room are very friendly, connect. Thank you guys for coming and see you later.